this country. Lord, we just pray, Father, for the, for the leaders. Father, we pray right now, Father, for conviction upon the heart. There's, there is one change that needs to take place, Father, and it's the gospel. The gospel that truly transforms. And so we pray for this country. There, we pray that there will be a spirit led by your church that will impact and influence this country. Father, I just pray right now, Father. I just pray. Lord, I pray also, Father, for this sickness that's been over our land for so many months, Father. But Lord, you're in control. You're sovereign, Father. Nothing takes you by surprise. Lord, I just pray, Father, for the families that have been impacted and the sickness and the loss. Lord, you will comfort them, Father. But you will encourage them, Lord. Encourage their hearts today. Let them know, Father, you're real. You're the ultimate healer. You're the ultimate peace giver. Lord, I pray for them. I pray for them, Father. Lord, I pray for the church. Lord, I pray, Father, that we, Father, will lead out. We will be bold in our community. We will be bold in this country. We will be, we will be bold in this world. Lord, let, let people see you through us. Lord, as we pray, we earnestly, we earnestly pray, not, not some casual prayer. Father, but we are burdened. And we are, we are praying for transformation. We are praying for the lost to come to know you as their Savior, Father. That's what we're praying for, Lord. That's what we're praying for. And Lord, we just pray right now, Father. We pray for this time of worship, Lord, that we come prepared to worship you. We, we come to exalt you, to lift you up. Lord, you, you have to be this perfect, amazing God in order for us to worship, Lord. And I just pray, Father, we, we're, we don't limit you. You're not that kind of God. You're a holy God. You're a perfect God who knows every single thing that's going on right now, Father. And you're the one we turn to. And so that, Father, in that, Lord, we have to worship you. Lord, we have to lift you up. We have to exalt you to the highest. And Lord, I pray we do that in our worship. Lord, I pray as Brother Rusty comes, Lord, I pray his boldness, Father, will be so evident. The clarity will be so clear. And Lord, as we hear his word, your word being preached, as he is preaching that, Father, I just pray it breaks our heart. And Lord, through the Spirit, it will transform us. It will take us out of this place, Father. And help us, Father. Encourage us. Move us to action. That's what I pray for right now, Father. In Jesus' name. In your name. Amen.
maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh Lord, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, now, even when I don't see it.
humbling ourselves and bowing down before the one who is infinitely worthy of all of our praise and all of our worship. Lord, we ask and pray that we might hear from your word today, that you would bless it to our understanding and help us, Lord, to live it, not only to hear it, Lord, but to heed it and to live it out to the praise and the glory of the one who loved us and gave himself for us, even our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray, amen. It would be an understatement to say that what's happened in our country this past week was just really absolutely unbelievable. We all hate it, preachers especially hate it, because preachers enter into a week with a plan, a target that you want to hit. And when things like this happens, it turns your plan in regard to what you maybe need to preach on its, on its head. I was going to jump right back into, as of Monday morning, right back into our series on Ephesians and talk this morning about the obligations of wives to their <coughs> husbands. And ladies, I'm not going to do that today. And uh, so you're, you're good today. Uh, you don't have to hear it today. You might not want to hear it next week or ever. And so that, that, that would be well and fine. But that, that was the plan. But what happened, I think it was on Tuesday, set uh, my plan on its head. And so Friday morning, been a busy week, a lot of things happening. By Friday morning, I thought, you know, I, I really ought to think about a sermon for Sunday. And uh, I, I, need to, I need to pull something together. And so as I thought that thought, a million and one things came to my mind, a million and one thoughts, a million and one options, and nothing seemed right. And I asked myself, okay, self, so what are we going to do here? Well, why don't we ask the Lord? Maybe he has an opinion on it. Kind of felt like the Anglican curate, curate, Brother Buss, an associate pastor in the Anglican church. And the curate was supposed to preach for the vicar who was going to be out of town on vacation, on holiday. The curate sits in his little study and he asks himself the question, what I'm going to preach. And the answer is to himself, I have no idea. I need some help. And so he picks up the telephone and he calls the bishop and he says to the bishop's secretary, may I speak to the bishop? Yes, you may speak to the bishop who's calling his curate so-and-so. And so the bishop gets on the phone and says, curate so-and-so, what's your issue here? I hear you're preaching Sunday. He said, well, that's the issue. I have no idea what to preach, so I thought I would call you and ask you what it is I should preach. He said, he said two things. Number one, preach the Bible. Number two, preach about 20 minutes. And so I didn't call the bishop this morning in re relationship to this morning, but I did talk to the Lord, and the Lord impressed upon my heart. He said, as I asked the question, what do you want me to speak about this coming Lord's Day? I think I heard him say, preach Christ. Amen. Preach Christ. Amen. Is there anything else to preach? Amen. Preach Christ. I've been doing this for almost 40 years. And you'd think I'd get that. But sometimes we forget. But the Lord has a good way of reminding us. Preach Christ. It was Spurgeon who said to preachers, Choose a text, make a beeline for the cross. And we need to do that today, don't we? Amen. Because we so desperately need the Lord Jesus Christ every day. Amen. But we need the Lord Jesus Christ most certainly and most surely in these days. In these days of tumult and trial. In these days of tribulation. In these days of unrest and upheaval, in these days of unrestrained and unmitigated evil, in these days of moral disintegration, in these days of pronounced incivility, and we do live in an incivil, uncivil day, do we not? People just fighting. The rancor is so thick you could cut it with a knife. I had a video dropped on my YouTube feed last week. And it dates back to the good old days of 1981. Those were the good old, good old days, college days. Uh, 
pizza, days of late night study and pizza, onion pizza, onion pizza. You know why I ordered onion pizza? Because nobody in the dorm would want to eat onion pizza. <laughs> if you had anything else they don't want to eat. And so I figured I'd get some onion pizza. And I did, man. They were bringing that stuff in from Minaldi's, which was right across the street. The pizza was the front. The real business occurred in the back. And it was, it was not legal business. They shut them down my sophomore year in college. Most Italians could make some pizza, though. And so I, I thought I was going to do an experiment. I'm going to get onion pizza. So I got onion pizza. It, 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 it came through the dorm and along with it, along with it, a whole crowd of guys. And they came to my door. And they brought the pizza and said, come on in. It was, it was $2, $5 pizza, $3 coupon. And you get it for 2 bucks. And so I, I, I brought it in. They brought it in. I gave them my $2. The guy said, can I have some? I said, sure, you can have as much as you want of this. And I pulled the box open, and immediately the dorm room was filled with pleasant aroma or stench, depending on where you stand on the issue of onions. I said, go, go ahead, guys. You want some? Get you a slice. What is that nasty stuff? I said, it was pizza. Well, it's not like pizza we normally order. So it's onion pizza, and it's going to be onion pizza until you leave me alone. Well... <laughs> Those were the good old days. In January 1981, Walter F. Mondale, senator from the state of Minnesota at one time, the vice president and the president of the Senate, the vice president of the United States, Jimmy Carter's vice president, they mounted a campaign against the, the uh, candidate, Republican candidate Ronald Reagan, who won that election in a landslide. As the Vice President, Mondale had the responsibility of standing in the Senate and reading the result of the electors. He told the number of electors that had voted for Ronald Reagan. They were significant, substantial. He read the numbers that voted for Jimmy Carter, which were not significant, not substantial. He read then the electors that had cast their ballot for the Vice President. And of course, George W. Bush got a lot of electors. And then he had the responsibility maybe the embarrassing responsibility of reading his name, Walter F. Mondale, and then he had to quote and mention the paltry, pathetic number of electors that voted to, that voted for him. Now, you would have thought that he would have been angry, that he would have been put out and put off, but as he read the numbers of the electors that voted for him, he did so with a smile that erupted in a chuckle and before you know it, the entire Senate was roaring in laughter. And the entire Senate, both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, stood and gave him a round of applause. And as they were doing that, he turns to Tip O'Neill and he says to Tip O'Neill, it was a landslide, wasn't it? And he chuckled and laughed. He said, landslide, the biggest landslide next to the Nixon landslide and the one he ran against McGovern. And he just belly laughed, big old tip. We don't see that sort of thing in political life anymore, do we? We're in a civil society. Political life, it's everywhere. The incivility and the lack of respect that human beings show one to another. In these days, we need Jesus. Because in these days we are witnessing seismic shifts from a nation that once embraced and enshrined Judeo-Christian values to one that has cast off these supposed outdated, outmoded ideas and replaced them with something better with a society now that's becoming wholly secular and that has and possesses and seeks to Voiced upon the rest of us a godless view of existence and a godless view of life. We're talking about changes, great changes, profound changes. And who likes change? I remember my little, my three year old daughter. We were excited because we were able to get rid, we were in a position to get rid of our old furniture. The old stuff, the hand-me-downs that young couples used to have to have in order to make it. And we were excited to get rid of the torn, tattered chairs, and we were excited to get rid of the old couch that had been around as long as my wife could remember. We were 
excited to get rid of that stuff. It had been good stuff and it served us well, but we wanted something new. And we, because of a little windfall, were able then to go out to the furniture store and procure a new living room suit. And I was excited. I was able to get rid of that orange velour recliner, and I was able to get a brand new blue velour Lane Rocker recliner. The man of the house got a big recliner and a brand new couch. So when they came to take away the old stuff, Amy and I were just, dang, weird. It's, it's onward and upward. We're something. We've got new furniture. We can brag about it to our friends. <laughs> they got rid of the old and brought in the new, and my oldest daughter ran to her room in tears. Took her blanket and her passy. At three, yeah, we finally got rid of it at 13. She was <laughs> eight. <laughs> on the way to junior high one morning, just stood out one and <laughs> I went back to her room and I said, what's wrong? They took away, they took away my place. What do you mean they took away your place? You know my place, Daddy. Well, what do you mean my place? In, 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 on, on that, on that, oh, I said on the couch? Because she would go to her place to a corner, prop a pillow up in the corner and she would just kind of curl up there and suck her passy and, and rub the soft edge of that blanket. And, and watch Inspector Gadget. And she was devastated because change had come. Well, she should have celebrated that change, and finally, she finally kind of came around and embraced the change. Because after all, it was good change. We were replacing something old with something new and something better. But not all change is good change. The fundamental transformation of America, spoken about in 2008, at least in my mind, in my way of thinking, was not necessarily good change. But my opinion is, is that what was um, initiated then will go into hyperdrive now. We have been affected to some degree by these ideas, and at least I think will continue to be affected in profound ways. And so, for many of us, we find ourselves to be profoundly disturbed and even frightened by what has come to pass and what may indeed come to pass right before our eyes. And I'm not necessarily talking about winners and losers in a national political election. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here this morning is the institutional, the cultural, moral collapse of a once God-fearing people called the United States of America. And in view of this, and this by the way, this by the way is absolutely undeniable. We cannot argue, we cannot go back and forth on whether or not our country is worth, worse off in these categories than we were 40 years ago. Obviously, clearly, we are. But the question becomes this, as we watch our TVs, as we watch people parade through and pillage our Capitol building, as we watch folks on the streets destroy buildings and burn cars and hit and hurt people, we ask ourselves, okay, What now? What are we going to do? And we ask this in respect to ourselves. Because if we're honest, we may admit that there's not much that little old me can do to bring about change in a more positive, constructive way. We ask the question oftentimes, and there may be something we can't do, but we ask the question oftentimes in respect and in relation to how am I going to respond and how in my mind and heart am I going to deal with this? 
The barbarians have stormed the gates. Now how am I going to respond? There are a couple options. We can fret. And we can live in fear. We can yield to discouragement and despair. We can give way to despondency and even perhaps depression. That's one option. The other option is perhaps less evident. But we have to put it out there on the table. And it's this. And really for the Christian, there is no, there is no, other, there is no other option. We have to remind ourselves of that from time to time, don't we? Just like the song that we sang just a few moments ago that you responded to in a most appropriate way when, he sang, when we sang He is Worthy. That's a great song. And within that song, within the context of it, we, we sometimes have to remind ourselves of this. That we are God's people. Amen. And as God's people, we are not, and I don't care what happens in this country. And I don't care at the end of the day who's responsible for it. Be it Black Lives Matter or the Proud Boys. I don't care who's responsible for the upset and the division and all the rest of it. It's, 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 it's wildly unfortunate. And it's wildly terrible. But it is what it is. And the question is, in the midst of it, how are we going to live? And what are we going to do? I'll tell you what we must do. We as God's people have only one option. And the option is this. To stand firm. Amen. In these days, we must stand firm. When everything about us is shifting and moving and changing, what are we to do? I'll tell you what we're to do. We are to stand firm. You look at Paul's letters and he tells the people of God who lived in a similar society but much worse. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a ways to go yet to catch up with what happened in those far reaches of the Roman Empire. We've got a ways to go yet. We're getting there. It seems like we're on a, a, a greased rail because it seems like we're getting there really, really quickly and very, very fast. But we've got a lot of ground to make up to catch up with what those early Christians were dealing with as they lived under the thumb of Roman occupation. He tells them in Corinth, a debauched, despicable place. Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, stand firm then. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. He tells the people of God at Philippi, chapter 4, verse 1, this is how you stand firm. Oh, good, a how-to sermon. What kind of? Kind of a how-to sermon. But we all don't want a how-to, don't we? Okay, preacher, you're saying stand firm, but how? You're saying, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. But how in the world are we to do that when it seems like that the world as we know it is caving in upon us? How in the world do we stand firm? We stand firm in view of a couple of things and we find them spoken of clearly in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. We have to understand something clearly and obviously. Though we live in the world, and we live in this world, right? And Jesus says in the midst of this world, we are to be salt and light. Jesus said that we are to let our light so shine before men that they would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Jesus says as we participate in the world of whatever level we do, then we must also pray in a commensurate way that the kingdom would come, that the will of God would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're here. Our feet right now are placed upon terra firma. But this isn't all that there is for us. 
There are so many people who walk alongside us every day whose feet are planted on this world, this earth, this terra firma, and all they see is what they can see around them in a horizontal sort of way. The Apostle Paul talks about those kinds of people in the preceding verses, and he says, you know what their problem is? Their problem is they are too earthly minded. They live in this world, and this world for them is all that there is. It's the beginning, and it's the end. It's the all and the end all. But that shouldn't be for us. Now, Paul says that our citizenship, and they knew something about citizenship. They were citizens of that way far off place called Rome. They lived in Philippi separated by hundreds of miles, and yet they were very proud of the fact that they themselves as Philippians were Roman citizens and had benefits and had advantages because of that relationship that they had with Rome. Paul says you as believers in Christ are part of the commonwealth. You are citizens in heaven. And because of that, you need to look above. There's a lot of stuff that can get you down and pull you aside if you'll let it. But you need to look above, just like he says in Colossians chapter 4, verses 1, verses 2. He says in verse 1, set your heart on things above where Christ is. Set your heart on Christ. He says in verse 2, do not set your heart on and look upon worldly things and earthly things, but set your mind on things above. Why would we do such a thing? We are citizens of heaven. And we look forward to that glorious, that celestial city that the word of God talks about in Revelation chapter 21. That blessed new heaven and new earth which will come down for heaven as a bride prepared for her groom. We look forward to that city. We are citizens of that city. Though it is far away, it is for us in a very real sense, incredibly, incredibly near. And it's to that city that we owe our complete and absolute allegiance. Amen. This world is not our home. We're just a passion for if heaven were my home, my, 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 what in the world would it be, right? I never thought I would quote Patricia Heaton in a sermon. I think she played on Everybody Loves Raymond. She is a Christian and just vociferously pro-life. I saw a tweet from her one day this past week, and the tweet I, I, th I thought was kind of appropriate to what we're talking about. She said, if you're a common sense person, you probably don't feel like you have a place in this world right now. If you're a Christian, you were never meant to. Makes sense. Our citizenship our ultimate devotion, our ultimate allegiance, our ultimate commitment is to the things of God possessed and reserved for us in heaven. So there's no need to fret and there's no need to fear because there's no need for us to overindulge ourselves on a Twitter feed, on YouTube drops, on news, I don't care what channel it's on. On news, on the radio, talk shows, all of that business. Now, I found myself kind of getting upset about what happened this past week in our nation's capital. I finally just had to grab myself by the sweater. I'm a holy man this morning. A holy man. <laughs> Only really because my sweater, as I found out as I put on this morning, is holy. <laughs> Marina wool. First time I've worn it this year. The moths, Jesus said, you know, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where things rust and moths eat it away. Well, they think they've done it. So I, I've got to fold it just right so you can't see the holes quite so easily. Grab myself by the sweater, by the shirt. Stop it. Stop it, man. 
this ain't good. All this stuff. It's toxic. It's terrible. It's corrosive. It's eating away at your soul and spirit. Look up. Look up. And we can. And we should as citizens of heaven. And as we look up as citizens of heaven, as we set our minds on things above, we do so in two ways. We do so, according to Paul, in anticipation. He's coming, and we eagerly await. I love that phrase, don't you? Eagerly await. When we used to get a letter from a grandmother or the grandparents or maybe a favorite aunt or favorite uncle, my anticipation would go into hyperdrive because I couldn't wait to see him because it would have likely been a long time, a long span of time between our last visit. And so the anticipation builds because mom begins to cook. The anticipation builds because we're scurrying about getting the house clean and the yard just right and the last little twig of grass perfectly trimmed awaiting their arrival. Of course, they would walk past it and never give it a thought. But, you know, you've got to do what you've got to do in order to make yourself feel better. We get it all together, and then I just stand and wait. What are you doing? I'm, I'm waiting. Well, they're not coming. They're not coming until so-and-so. I, 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 I don't care. I'm just, I'm just maybe they'll surprise us. I've got to stand and wait and watch and wait and watch. We don't do that too much as Christians. I mean, we at least have it so good here. Life's so good, so comfortable, so convenient. And sometimes we're so earthly minded that we're of no heavenly good whatsoever. And I used to hear that, people talk about that phrase, and I thought, that just doesn't seem right to me. And then I began to read the Word of God, and it became apparent why it didn't seem right, because it's not right. We're always to be watching, we're always to be waiting, we're always to have our face, as it were, pressed up against the window, pressed up against the door, saying to ourselves, I cannot wait. Till he gets there, I cannot wait until he comes. Amen. And he's coming. He is. He's, he's a promise keeper. And what did he promise us? He said in his own words of these, he'll be coming on the clouds in power and great glory. Amen. And we look forward to seeing him face to face. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. My Jesus. Well, what is he? And who is he? Oh, we could talk at length about who he is, but time will not allow us to do so. I was bragging last week about the fact that the clock had been taken down and removed and replaced by the all-seeing eye. And I was really excited about that. I was in here doing something last week, and I looked up, and I saw it. There it is, right, right there, propped up on a, something or other. In, in full view of the preacher's eye, and it's back there, and it's telling me you cannot go where you want to go with this. But the shepherd's coming. The good shepherd. The chief shepherd great shepherd to gather his sheep and his people. And yet until he does, he is there for us to provide for us, to protect us, to be our portion, to be our peace. And in the midst of that blessedness, we've looked Toward the heavens and we say as the church, as the early church did specifically, we say with them and we say with the saints of God through the ages, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come quickly. Why hasn't he come yet? Well, that's another, that's another story. That's another talk for another time. But he is patient with you. Not only any to perish, but all to come mm -hmm. to repentance. And a thousand years is like a day unto him, but he will make good his promise, and he will come 
and we wait in eager anticipation. As the earth fights and fusses, as they engage in conflict and in clamor for power, we look heavenward, expecting to see, eagerly awaiting the glorious coming of our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ. We're citizens of heaven, and we look upward because he's coming. We are citizens of heaven, and when he comes, he's changing. He's changing everything. And he can accomplish it not through the stroke of a presidential pen upon a piece of paper that contains an executive order. Oh, you're powerful because you've got a pen and you know how to use it. I am so sick and tired of hearing these bloviating blowhards. I respect our leaders to an extent. Talk about this transition of power. That's the problem. It's like Lord Acton said. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. You don't have power. You've got responsibilities. And those guys are not doing a good job, at least in my mind, either side of the aisle, of fulfilling their responsibilities to the people. You don't have power. You've got responsibilities. I've been privileged at different times in my ministry to go to the state house and the state senate. I doubt we have any senators or house members watching today, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. <laughs> been in both sides, both sides. And the last time I was up there, uh, maybe, it, I don't know why, I, was, I came home and, and I was up there for a week and led prayer every day, brought a devotional. Uh, some of the more progressive, left-leaning people, uh, House members got up and stomped out of there. Uh, when I began to talk about the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and its relevant application, the whole thing's a silo. They were not too happy about that. I thought, well, that's, that's, that's the way it ought to happen, really and truly. So I, I knew I was pushing some buttons, not intentionally, but I was pushing some buttons. But I got home, and I told my wife, and this this isn't, I just told my wife, I'll just tell her. It's no wonder, it's no wonder the government's in such a mess. You know, I think sometimes we think those folks are just otherworldly in terms of intelligence and capacity and ability and the like. And I got up there and I rubbed shoulders with them for a week and I said, you know what? After rubbing shoulders with these demigods, I'm not impressed. It's no wonder we're in such a it's such a mess. You expect people like that to really be informed and I try to strike up a conversation about so and so, so I don't know anything about that. I'm thinking, you ought to. You should. You gotta be joking. And maybe they're just trying to skirt me. I, I, I don't know. But I, I wasn't too I wasn't too impressed. But they try to make the changes. With votes. Votes. The eyes have it. A vote. Or an executive order. This will change it. Well, until the next guy comes in the office. Then they'll just kick it out and do another one. So the changes for a year, two, three, maybe four. Maybe longer. But one of these days, for the Christian, for you and for me, he's coming. And things are changing. You know why they're going to change? I'll tell you why they're going to change. Because he's the one who holds complete, absolute, and total control in his hands. I think it was Psalm 9. I was reading the other day in my devotional. Psalm 9 says, the Lord reigns and power and dominion are his. He's in control. And Jesus Christ the Lord will rule until he subdues all of his enemies. He's ruling. He's reigning now. But one of these days, he's going to be ruling and reigning more thoroughly and more completely than we could ever possibly.
possibly imagine when he brings with him the new heavens and the new earth. I'm here to tell you today, change is coming. Paul talks about it. And we eagerly await a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. I don't know about you, but if I could turn a backflip back flip right now, I would. Because those words in these days are mighty powerful Amen. to me. This one that has the control also has the power to transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I look forward to that. That's really not out of step with what we're talking about here. Your struggle is my struggle. My struggle is your struggle. Our struggle is Paul's struggle. What did he say? What I do, I shouldn't. Well, what, what I want to do, I don't do. What I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. When he comes, that's going to be taken care of. That's going to be settled and situated. But all of society is going to be settled and situated too. Because if you look at the balance of the Bible, the balance of the Bible says he's going to take care of you, but he's going to take care of everything else too. Until he does, the world's going to groan. And boy, I don't know if you were listening this past week, but the world was groaning. Big time. But when he comes, he's changing. And he's changing everything. 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 He's coming. He's changing. And as a citizen of heaven, you know what that enables me to do? Paul tells us what it enables me and you to do. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord. Dear friends, that's how we stand firm. <coughs> he's coming. He's changing. And to know that, no matter what happens on this planet, to know that is enough for me. Let's pray together. Lord, it's enough for all of us to know that you're coming and that you're changing everything. And our hope and our confidence is in you and your blessed Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to apply these words to our hearts in the power of the Holy Spirit. If there is one Father that's never come to the Lord Jesus Christ and received him as Lord and Savior, whether they be here in this worship center this morning or whether they be viewing by virtue and by way of Facebook Live, we ask and we pray, Father, that they might come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. If there are others who need to make other decisions, Father, we would welcome them and give you the praise and the honor and the glory for them. Help us this week to stand firm with our face fixed on the heavens, looking forward to that grand and glorious day when our Savior, Jesus, shall appear. We love you and bless you and ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's going to be here at the front after the service. If you'd like to talk to him about a spiritual commitment, a spiritual issue, we'll be happy to talk with you and pray with you. As would I, Doug, or any other member of our staff. If you come to give your offering and haven't had the opportunity to do that yet, you can do it. The guys will be in the uh, foyer and we'll be happy to receive it and put that where it needs to go. Um, hopefully, hopefully by next Sunday, we're going to have on the sign pole out there our brand new Ford by a digital display sign. We're hoping to have that installed this week and we hope to have a nice, colorful, uplifting message on it uh, for you as you drive into the church uh, parking lot next week. We're excited about that and uh, look forward to getting that up and look forward to getting that going. Until then, thank you so very much for coming. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May we stand as we go and close as we sing. God bless you and thank y'all so much for coming and being here.